Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We, um, as I said, we're going we're gonna to start a series this week um, on the attributes of God. Um, and I just want to show you once more this, this theme verse, okay, that I, I think has, has been really, it's been a striking verse. I've had it on my mind for the last couple of weeks. Um, I really like the, the simplicity and the desire and the heart of this verse that comes from Hosea, uh, where Hosea says, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. Right? Like if you're gonna have, if you're gonna, if you're in the custom of sort of like memorizing verses or or uh, or keeping verses in your mind or writing them on note cards or writing them on your on your the you know some people write them on the mirror of their bathroom or things like that so they're kind of like readily on their mind um, and in front of them. I like this. I like this verse and the simplicity of it and the call to just grow in the knowledge and the love of the Lord. Just this simple desire. Like if you're gonna have kind of a theme verse for your life, this is a good one. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. Um, and I like, I like it uh, for a lot of reasons. One, for its simplicity and its beauty. But also, I like it simply because um, of the word know. And know in the Hebrew language is a very, um, is a very big, deep word. Okay? So, uh, know in Hebrew is the word yada. Yada, okay? And now you might be thinking like yada, 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 which is the exact opposite of what this word means. It's not like something mindless that you should not pay attention to. But uh, yada in the Hebrew language is to know. And it's not, um, it's not just to know in your mind, okay? We, we, have a, we get a lot of knowledge, okay? We have a lot of information in our day and age that passes by us. Probably more than any other society in all the world, you can access information and get information that can, can kind of go into your brain in a split second, you know? Like more than the libraries of Alexandria, you can access information on your phone and news on your phone that most people would not have known in a lifetime a hundred years ago. It's fascinating, right? But so much of the kind of information that we experience in life is just this kind of head knowledge that kind of passes in and out of our mind that we don't really, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't affect us at all, it doesn't change us at all. You may kind of know it, but uh, it doesn't mean anything, okay? That's not the word yada. It's not the word yada. This is a better picture of Yada. Yada is to know, know something both in your mind and in your heart. Okay? It's something that, uh, that goes from, from just intellectual information to, uh, to core beliefs and ideas that kind of change and animate who you are and how you live. Okay? That's yada. So go back for a second and just look at this verse. Let us know the Lord. Let us press on to know the Lord. In that way. This kind of mind, heart, body connected. Not just information that passes through your mind. Not just some stuff that you can spout out to let people know that you're smart or know things or to kind of like pad your own security or ego. But this deep abiding sense of knowledge of who God is and what he's like. And that's what I really desire for the next eight weeks to kind of be about in our church, is to, for us to press in to God. Let us know. Let us press in to know him. You know, that, that's, that's what I desire to do. And so, for the next eight, eight weeks, I just want to look at the character of God, who he is, and the characteristics that he talks about throughout the scripture of what he is like. So, uh, the, the scriptures are full of different attributes of God. But, through the many centuries, the church has kind of located about eight of them. That uh, they really say, these are attributes that throughout, consistent throughout all the scripture, define who God is and what he's like. Okay, so they're this. The attributes of God. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. 
He's good. He is loving. He is sovereign. He's faithful. He is gracious. He is ever-present. These are the attributes of God that he gives to his people and says, you, do you want to know some of the core identities, some of the core descriptions of who I am and what I am like? These are them. This is what you can count on me for. This is what throughout history I will be like and that you can bank on me being like. Um, and so it's good for us to kind of have these in our mind and even to be able to recall them because we hear a lot of information about God uh, and a lot of people spout a whole lot of like false theology about what they think about what God is like, okay, essentially. And, um, and a lot of them will go against these very ideas. And it's good to just know and say like, hey, when people are saying that God is not around, he actually doesn't say that. His word tells us over and over and over again that he is present. Uh, when people question the goodness of God, that's not what scripture says. Even when it's dark, even when we don't understand, even when bad things happen, he promises us that he is working those things out for good, right? So it's good to have these in our mind to challenge the kind of beliefs and contradictions of the, of the world. And today we're going to take up this idea of God being all-knowing. And I just want to meditate and think about, uh, as a church, for, uh, for the moment, in what ways God thinks about, um, or, wh or what things God knows, and he says and proclaims to us that he knows for certain, okay? So, uh, we're just going to go through some of these. That God knows all about, he starts in the beginning, right? God knows all about creation, right? He's the one who formed it. It was his idea, the word of his mouth that he spoke, brought it all into being, and he keeps it and holds it in existence for all eternity. And he knows every single piece and part in detail. This is some of the stuff I was talking to in our, uh, our kids in our kids' message. Listen to some of these things that God says. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields, they're mine. Have you ever thought about this? Okay, so, so there are like 10,000 species of birds around the world. Species, which means billions of birds all around the world. And God's saying, I know all of them. Even the ones that kind of hide up in the clefts of the rock that nobody knows about. You ever been up in Glacier Park and you see like the cubby holes for the birds and things like that? God's saying, those ones, I know them too, right? Or have you ever been outside? Um, and it will be quiet and you can think there's nothing going on until you kind of look down at the ground. And you can see that it's a kind, of a, kind of a whole world of ants and bugs and little creatures out. My kids are doing this all the time. Isla's kind of at this stage where she'll be walking and she's, uh, you know, like two and a half feet tall. So she sees everything that's happening on the ground. And when she will walk uh, along, the, along the ground, she'll often go, Ant! And she'll look down, and then she'll get way down on her, on her hands and knees, and she'll look at these bugs. And I think it's kind of so fascinating that, like, a like all around us, there are things moving and creatures all over the place that are big, that are noticeable. But on the ground, there are all these tiny things happening, just a whole other universe of stuff. And that God says, those insects that your daughter is so fascinated by and so caught up with, they're mine. I know them. It's a fascinating, sort of beautiful thing. On a cosmic and grand level, Psalm 147 says this. It says, He determines the numbers of the stars and calls them each by name. Uh, I don't know a lot about um, the, the, the universe or about stars or things like that, so I was looking this week, and I was just doing a little bit of research on our galaxy, uh, the Milky Way galaxy that we're a part of and that you can see in the night sky, and I was wondering how long it takes to travel from one end of the Milky Way galaxy to the other end. 157,000 light years. 157,000 light years it would take to travel from one end of the Milky Way galaxy to the other, okay? And that's one galaxy, and there are countless other galaxies all around, uh, the, all around the universe, okay? And God is saying, each one of the stars in each one of the galaxies, not only did I create them, not only did I throw them into being, but I know them 
and I have names for all of them, right? This is what the scripture should do when you kind of hear the, and this is the point of why God's word says this sort of thing, is that when you hear this, you should pause on it and go, huh, wow, that is fantastic, right? That, that, that should be the response. And that's a good and holy response, that when we think about and wonder at the character of God, that we say, wow, that is beautiful and wonderful. Okay? So God knows all about creation. Uh, God also says that he knows all about history. Remember one of the names that God gives himself. He says, uh, he says I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Okay? He says this in Isaiah 46.10. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say... My purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Right? It is, it's, it's kind of an unfathomable thing to think that God is one beyond time. And tells us, he's the Alpha of the Omega, like I, I'm the bookends of things. Everything else that happens between those bookends is your universe, is your life, is your existence, is the way that you think. But I think outside of that. I am the Alpha and the Omega, and I see the huge and large scope of all of history. Have you ever had that sort of perspective in life where you can kind of see uh, above or, or see, see like the bigger picture of things? I think sometimes as parents we can do this, like where, where we can have children who are kind of a, caught up in the drama or the hardship of a single moment, where they, it's, it's hard for them in a single time, and, and they're, they're really caught up in thinking, like, oh, goodness, how am I ever going to get over this? How am I ever going to get through this? How am I ever going to get past this? But you as a parent kind of know a greater span of time, and you think, oh, you know, You'll get through it. It's okay. We'll, we'll work through it. I, I'm secure that, like, history's not going to end with this problem. It'll be okay, right? Have you ever thought about how God stands above history? And we are in the midst of it, just like these little children who experience things, and they're hard, and we, and we, and we struggle to understand sometimes and struggle to think, like, how is God working this whole story out for, uh, for his good purposes, but he sees the grand picture of history. He says, I'm above it all. I see the whole big picture. Don't worry. Even though you're kind of in the minute and the moment of it, and it seems very hard, very challenging, I see the bigger picture. And don't worry, okay? I'm taking care of it. I, I, I find wonderful comfort in the fact that God knows all about history. Tomorrow doesn't surprise God, okay? Uh, uh, 500 years from now, if we're still here on earth, okay, the earth is still turning and God hasn't remade it all. He has a plan for that day. And that's, and that's a wonderful, secure thing for me to think about. I like this idea. J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God, says this about history. Uh, and this is a good, good kind of perspective on history. Uh, that history is ultimately his story. Okay? It's God's story. It's the book that he's writing. And uh, he knows the beginning and the end of it. And we can find this deep abiding security in the fact that God is the author of that history and stands above it all and says, I'm writing this story. Do not worry. Okay? Um, so I, I, I think that's a, that's a beautiful idea that God knows all about history. Also, um, if God knows all about history and all about his creation, then that necessarily means that he knows a lot about me, okay? Uh, a lot about my own life, about my own personality, about my own dealings in life. And um, he also, Scripture says, in a lot of different places, that God knows my failures. So Psalm 69, 5 says, uh, God, you, God, know my folly, my guilt is not hidden from you. But isn't it striking how much we as God's creatures and God's creation try to uh, pretend like that verse and that truth is not actually truth? Think about Adam uh, and Eve at the beginning of creation when they fell. Um, and God comes searching for them in the garden and says, where are you? And they kind of raise their hand and come out from behind the bushes and say, we're right here. We've done something wrong, right? And what are they wearing? Remember? 
They're wearing like a suit of fig leaves to cover up their shame. As if a, a leaf would keep God from knowing what th their heart and what they've done, right? It's like they're, they're covering up from God and saying, oh, we, we're going to hide what we've done wrong with something ridiculous like a, like a, a fig leaf, okay? But God sees straight through it. I, I think it's the same way in our lives. So we like to pretend like God doesn't know, that God doesn't know. Uh, and we, we live a lot of our lives kind of hiding from things, trying to put on the kind of lipstick and rouge of life to make sure that people don't know our failings or our problems or a hardship uh, or, uh, or, or, or the million other things that we try to hide in life. Okay? I think it's good to me to hear regularly that God knows that like the hiding game can just go away. That it's okay to just be honest with God and be honest with those who are around us who love us and care for us. To say like, this is who I am. I'm not interested in hiding anymore. My failures or my, or my problems or my hardship. Okay? Um, God knows them. I'm not afraid for you to know them. And I have the security to do that because I know that God not only knows my failures, but has sent his son to cover my failures. To send, has sent his son to make atonement for my, uh, for my brokenness and my, and my failures. It's a, it's a beautiful truth to me that God knows all about me, the deepest depths of my heart, and says, you don't actually need to hide from me. That's a beautiful thing. So God knows all about my failures. God knows all about my and your frustrations as well, he says. Uh, this is another verse from the Psalms. I'll be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my afflictions and knew the anguish of my soul. I know many of you, and I know many of, of your circumstances, how you can kind of live uh, day and life, night, or day and night, um, uh, and, and your life with afflictions and hardships that, that you just feel like you're alone in, okay? that, you, that you feel like nobody gets to see, whether it's kind of in your own head or in your own heart or in your lives or relationships, that God, uh, that you think, I, I, nobody knows these things, right? I take, again, this, this kind of com abiding comfort in the fact that God says that he knows all about my frustrations, the things that get on my nerves, the things that are hard for me, the afflictions that I bear kind of day in and day out and invites me, invites me, and invites you to bring those to him. If you look on those little prayer cards in your, in your, uh, in your seat back pockets, we put this verse from 1 Peter that's also in the Psalms where God says, cast your cares and your worries upon me, for I care for you, right? God sees our frustrations. God sees our afflictions and says, hey, come find rest and hope and invitation to rest in me with those afflictions and the anguish of your soul. And then uh, lastly, God knows all about my future. Um, Psalm 139 is probably one of the greatest uh, single psalms that kind of meditates on the fact that God knows us at all times. Um, and Psalm 139, verse 16 says this, that your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Psalm 139, 16, that he knows the whole span of our lives from beginning to end. Has it all planned out and written out and laid out for us? And again, it's a thing that I take deep comfort and hope in that God knows my future. Then there's something about it for me, okay, that like you and I don't get to read that book. It says they're written in his book, not the book that he gets to show us, okay? We don't get to read all the details of how our life is exactly going to work out and how all the pieces and parts are going to fall into place, okay? Um, but we can take deep security in the fact that God, who knows the future, is not surprised by it, right? So anything that comes our way, we can say, hey, God orchestrated this, and it's for my good, okay? Even if it seems very hard, even if it seems very challenging, even if it seems like something that's beyond me, that it's not beyond God. Again, it doesn't surprise him, or he is not surprised by it. I think in our life, we like to pretend like we are the ones who need to know everything, or that we are the ones who are, are, are the best kind of uh, holders of knowledge, 
And it's just foolish to live that way. I remember this, uh, there's this great, oh no, the Mark Twain quote's not in there. There's a Mark Twain quote where he says, uh, uh, he says, when I was 14 years old, my father was such a bother that I just wished he wasn't around. But when I was 21 years old, I realized that my father had learned a whole lot in seven years. <laughs> I sometimes think that that's the attitude that we have towards God, folks. That we are the ones who need to stand in judgment and know everything. We need to be in the know about all things. God says, take it easy. I have given you knowledge sufficient for salvation and sufficient for hope and sufficient for each day of your life. Find security in the fact that you don't need to know everything, but that I do know everything. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this, the things hidden belong to God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So us, so for our job, as people, is to hold fast to the things that God has revealed to us and hold them secure when we don't always know uh, the beginning and end of everything. Just a brief meditation here. Um, Psalm, or Genesis 131. Do you remember this? God creates everything, and on the sixth day, he, um, he rests, and he looks at all of the creation, and he sees it, and he says, it is very good. I've always been struck by that passage, folks. Because God, who knows all things, knows the beginning and the end of history, looks at his creation and knows that it's going to fall, knows that it's going to break, knows that his people in a short time are going to reject him, knows uh, the hardship and the famines and the struggles and the wars of all of history and looks at his people in that moment, knowing all things, and says, it's very good. Why does he do that? I truly believe it's for this reason, that God knows the full story. We live kind of right in the middle, where we can say, like, I don't know all the time. I'm not sure if it's going to work out for good. Remember that on the first day, or the, on the sixth day, when God had created all things, he looked at it and said it was good, knowing the full story, knowing the last day, saying, I've seen the full picture. I know the full story, and guess what? It is very good. So, if we're gonna if we're gonna take a posture, I think we take Psalm one thirty one. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful to me. But I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Hold, or like being held in your arms. That's the picture. Israel, church, people of the church at Creston, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forever, because he holds the future for all eternity. Let's pray together. Lord God, our future and our life is in your hands, uh, and those hands were... Um, were spread out on a cross to show uh, how much you know and understand and have secured our hope in history through your son Jesus. Help us take hope uh, for when we don't know that you hold us secure throughout all of life. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.